Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. A very warm welcome to everybody. Um, hartelijk welkom. But we're going to continue this um, evening in English. Though there's no English passport holder here on the on, on this side of the of the audience, but we're going to speak in English um, anyway. Very warm welcome, an evening, a talk on uh, the state of European journalism. Um, it's obvious, of course, that um, uh, there has been a lot of changes in European journalism, and it's obvious that we have a European election coming up. So we thought we'd take the occasion of, um, uh, the, of the judges of the European Press Prize being here in Amsterdam for a meeting to talk with you on um, the state of European journalism. We're very, very happy that you're here, that you're willing to join in a conversation on what you think is happening in Europe and what's happening with European journalism at the moment. This is a joint endeavor of the Bali and of the European Press Prize, and the European Press Prize was founded in the Bali six years ago. So we're very happy to have you back for a meeting. Um, and it's, um, um, we're going to try to shed some light on, on, on the state of journalism. Um, we have to take into account that um, over the past two years there's been three murders of uh, investigative journalists just within the European Union. I mean, we thought up until recent that that was a phenomenon of you know, countries outside the Union, but even nowadays, you know, we have to uh, uh, be aware of the fact that journalists are starting to get murdered even within European Union states. Um, so w what is the state of European journalism? What are the biggest uh, challenges journalists are facing and uh, how should we overcome those challenges? And how should the public be informed um, about important decisions to make about elections if there is um, uh, such big problems in journalism as we have? They might be coming out of the internet, they might be coming out of uh, threats from the underworld. Um, and we're going we're gonna to listen to you and, and talk with each other on these issues. Um, I'm very, very happy that you're indeed willing to join in. Um, we um, welcome Yevgenia Albats, who is, um, uh, has been here talking in Bali before as a freedom lecturer a few years ago. Um, uh, she's the first uh, Soviet journalist to in have, have investigated the Soviet political police, the KGB. Even in, within the Soviet era, she, uh, times she did. She's the author of The State Within a State, KGB and Its Hold on Russia. Um, that's uh, that's a, a, a ter terrific title because a state within a state, that's indeed, if you read the book, that's what, what it is. Um, um, Yevgeny Albats is the author of uh, several books. Um, and she's currently the editor-in-chief and the CEO of the Moscow-based political weekly, The New Times, uh, one of the few independent media outlets in Russia, maybe maybe even the only one left. Um, that takes a lot of courage, actually, to do that. And we're very, very happy that you take the time off to be here and decide on the European Press Prize and to talk to us. Very welcome to you. Um, Sylvie Kaufmann, um, editorial director of the French newspaper Worldwide world-famous newspaper Le Monde. She's been serving as its chief editor as well. Um, Sylvie Kaufmann joined um, Le Monde in 1988 uh, as its Moscow correspondent. And as Eastern and Central Europe's correspondent, she covered the collapse of the Soviet Empire and the subsequent political and economic changes in Europe, Europe and Eastern Europe. And, um, and of course, very warm welcome to Dennis Staunton, London editor of the Irish Times. Um, moving uh, um, a very important times, I would say, for Ireland and for an Irish correspondent in, in Holland covering the Brexit. Uh, the Irish Times um, uh, um, 
Um, before joining the Irish Times, uh, he was a reporter for The Observer and The Guardian. Um, he's been working as foreign editor, um, as a foreign correspondent also in Berlin and Brussels and Washington. He's reported at various, uh, from many, many European countries and North America. So it's um, wonderful to all have you, to have these different views on from different cities, from different places all over Europe. Um, uh, tomorrow is an important day because you're going to decide on uh, the prices of the European Press Prize. And the European Press Prize is also, I mean, that's also very wonderful to have you here because not only from out of your own careers and your own um, uh, working uh, experiences you can tell us about it, but you have a good overview of what's been sent to you from all over Europe. So what's, what's the sort of the, the mood in, in European journalism? Um, but before I give the floor to um, Evgeny Albats, I'm... Uh, invite you to look at a little um, uh, uh, clip, movie we, we made on, on this issue and then we start with our conversation. He now lives in exile in Germany and has become a symbol of the struggle of the press under the rule of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. No more critics or jokes about Vladimir Putin will be allowed in internet. This is probably how the nearest future will look like. Well, her name was Victoria Marinova and this here is a picture of her. She was a well-known investigative journalist for Bulgarian TV channel TVN. Now her body was part found in a park on Saturday. Lots of people have been reacting to this including the committee to protect journalists and they have urged a thorough inve investigation in the wake of this. Former leader Robert Fico has been driven out by public anger over his government's response to the murders of 27-year-old journalist Jan Kuzia and his fiancée. And many of the values that Europeans care about deeply are values that we share, from the importance of human rights, from the need for community, uh, to the love of technology and all the potential that it can bring. Now Malta is in danger of falling to dirty money, and the one journalist who dared the most to tell the story has been assassinated. Over the years, Daphne worked on many stories and made a lot of enemies on the island and beyond. It is possible to target messages at particular individuals who will be unaware of the fact that you've been profiling them. Political campaigning is strictly regulated. Whatever money you spend needs to be registered. And Leave.eu's spending returns make no mention of Cambridge Analytica. When Leave.eu were first challenged about this, they said, oh, well, they did some work for us, but they were just helping out and they didn't get paid. Good, after this bleak picture, <laughs> we, um, um, I'd like to invite Evgeny Albats to kick off. We've asked all three of you to have a few thoughts so to start a conversation. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be in the Valley again, and I love Amsterdam, of course. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely city. So, and... You know, to be honest with you, when Soviet Union collapsed, we just spoke about that. It was, you know, there was amazing feeling that we're going to have a happy life ahead of us. And late 1980s and 1990s, these were very, very inspiring years. Of course, there were wars and people were dying. But there was this, there was this notion that world is getting to the better. And I think what happened in the last uh, three years is that all of a sudden we realized that this left-wing, right-wing populism is taking over and we really don't know how to deal with that. 
We also see in Europe that this notion that uh, Europe just learned its lessons out of two big wars. And it's going to make everything possible in order to prevent that scary development of events that somehow this experience and this belief sort of you know, started to disappear. And many of us who started you know, the, the, the prayer first world war epoch and what was going on in Germany uh, prior to the Second World War II, to the Second World War, you know, it's hard, um, it's hard not to notice certain similarities. And the situation with journalism, the situation with journalism is of course part of that, uh, of that problem. Uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, conducted a research that suggested that fake news, real fake news, they spread at the speed six times quicker than normal news. And apparently they have a much better chance to get reposted than normal news. I really don't know why it's happening. I have been thinking a lot. I do understand that you know it's part of it that it has to do with all kind of sensationalism. But still, you know, it's, it's so difficult to understand that that's in this digital, uh, digital age, people are so eager to grab all this shitty news, digest them, and believe in them. And that's a huge problem to ask to journalists, because it's one thing when you compete on the sort of leveled field, and it's totally different when you compete with invisible enemy. In my country and in my part of the world, you also compete with all these troll factories that are uh, that putting, you know, that totally following you and explaining to uh, readers on the Twitter and on the Facebook, don't trust them, don't believe them. These are all liberals, you know, they're trying to, dis to destroy Russia. They're, going, they're, they're anti-Russians. That's the label that they're using all the time. So, and you find yourself in this impossible situation when you have to explain all the time that basically you're not a, an idiot, you're not a camel, that you know, in fact you know, you're doing your job. This is one huge problem that, you know, this problem of this fake news, which are uh, um, at large produced by specific institutions and organizations, and who are very, very successful in that. Uh, the second problem, of course, is the power of the uh, social networks. On the one hand, for instance, in my country, where you know, there are strict authoritarian politics, where you know, almost no independent media left, where uh, you know, the graduates of the Soviet Union's political policy, the KGB, control all spheres of the society, where basically you know, three independent outlets left, and probably about 20, 30 people who are still doing political journalism in the country. So, uh, so it, it, for us, Facebook and Twitter is the way somehow to get uh, to get information, because otherwise, you know, the, in Russia, all electronic media, all but one radio station, are controlled by uh, by the state. All TV networks are controlled by the state, uh, and there is a, just a propaganda machine. There is no journalism left whatsoever; just propaganda machine. In, in fact, quite successful, quite, quite capable. 
So on the one hand, Facebook and Twitter is the way for us to get information, to spread information, and to let our readers know that they, in fact, can find something, some, uh, some normal investigations and normal stories on the web. On the other hand, we do know that Facebook and Twitter, that uh, these social networks became, you know, the uh, source of spread, of, that they're spreading all this fake news. You know that during the presidential, uh, 2016 presidential elections in the United States, 126 million uh, users of the American Facebook got a message that they shouldn't go and vote. And that's extremely important. There is just a book uh, been published by uh, Catherine Jamison, you know, the professor at the University of Pennsylvania, who is studying, statistically studying the American elections since 1974. She just showed that when the uh, outcome was on the margins and the American elections were decided by the 80,000 votes in three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, 80,000 votes. That's how, you know, uh, Trump won uh, electoral colleges. So that when you have it, it's very easy to manipulate you know, uh, those voters. And in fact, what might, according to Jamison, what might ha have happened is that this impact of uh, this troll, uh, trolls and you know, uh, fake uh, accounts on uh, uh, that, you know, basically the kind of message that they were trying to deliver is don't vote. So 126 million. Uh, American uh, Facebook users got the message, stay at home, better tweet, don't go and don't vote. And that's how uh, we know that uh, Hillary Clinton got uh, much less expected votes from the African Americans that she was expected to have. And there was, was you know, uh, s some other messages that were spread around. So Facebook and Twitter, they, these social networks are becoming in a way, real dangerous when they are used uh, by um, uh, by the uh, powers uh, like the one existed in my country. Finally, in the you know during the the the, the Cold War, the enemies they were very uh, you know the enemy lines, the front lines they were very pretty much clear. There was a total state, and you know, and there was you know the rest of the world. Whereas uh, now we see that uh, uh, that uh, Russian Czechists are very capable in conducting cyber warfare, and as we just spoke with uh, Sylvia, you know, Europe is not prepared for that. And these guys, they, they have no morals, you know. They, they, you know, they're directed towards, uh, 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 towards uh, winning this war. And they're very capable, and they're very determined, and they're not going to stop. And so once again, it's the question uh, to, which uh, to which extent we journalists are capable to inform the readership about the, the, the situation. How can we make people aware about, uh, the, the, about all these fake news, all these troll factories that operate uh, on the web? So that's, I think, you know, just to start the conversation, that's, I think, you know, the major problems besides the fact that we see the rise of authoritarian politics all across the globe. And uh, it's dangerous by itself. Uh, and people, it's, you know, 20 years ago, we never expected Russians to vote a, a former KGB guy into the office. And then it happened. And then it turned out that 86% of Russians uh, supported the annexation of Crimea. So it suggests that. Uh, that somehow we failed to get a message and we failed to inform you know, uh, our readership. Um, but it's not just about us. Look what's ha happening in Hungary. Look what's happening in Poland. You know, there is this 
uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, former communist countries, all of a sudden they started to backtrack from the European values. All of a sudden they started attached to populists and uh, um, right-wing uh, right politicians. So uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, how you're going to explain to me. What are you going to do? We are done. I'm pretty much clear about what's going to happen in my country. <laughs> but you know, how are you going to defend yourself? <laughs> Thank you very much, Evgeny Albat. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, um, uh, your thoughts. Um, before we uh, uh, move on into that part of the conversation, maybe a few questions on um, on yourself and on Russia, because you're, you're, you're saying there are three outlets left, maybe. There are 20 to 30 political journalists left. Um, um, is, is it out, becoming outlawed, or what's happening to... I mean, how does Putin kill off the free press? Is that... Does he need... I mean, is that the internet that kills it off, and he doesn't need any help, from, or, or is he helping it along to die? It's, it, it didn't happen overnight. It's been in you know, the process since 2003, Mm -hmm. um, you know, first they uh, they destroyed the uh, all the independent TV networks, yeah. and they put a, a firm hand over the TV networks. And then, you know, so step by step, they basically killed uh, the majority of independent media. But just let, to give you an example, last October, um, the New Times, which I added, uh, uh, was uh, got a fine at the amount of twenty two million rubles. It's been the biggest fine ever in the history of the Russian media. It was, it's equals to $340,000. Mm -hmm. um, why? Why? Because we were, you know, we were, we failed in time to submit one table. We all this info, it, it had nothing to do with uh, taxes because people immediately think that we didn't pay. No, no, no. We pay as much taxes as we can, uh, as we have to, because you know we know that we're dealing um, with, uh, with the, all these guys. No, no, no. We didn't do anything wrong, but we didn't submit in time one table that stipulated how much money we got through from the. Uh, foreign uh, uh, sources. The trick is that part of the money we, we, we do fundraising through the foundation, which was pronounced a foreign agent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, was one of the first which pronounced, was pronounced a foreign agent because one of our sponsors, Dmitry Zimin, a famous Russian businessman, the founder of the biggest Russian seller company, he was uh, sending us uh, his uh, sponsorship through, from Cyprus, and that's why we, we were pronounced as a foreign um, uh, as a foreign agent. So it's a pretext yeah. to give of you course. high fines in, in, in order, anyway, to, in order so, to, to get you out of business. But we didn't do so. It, it was the very first time these uh, article and this law was applied. The very first time. We already, you know, of course, you know, we now we uh, we went through all the courts. Now we're already in the Supreme Court, of, Court of the Russian Federation, and we're, of course, you know, we're going, we are going to file to the European Court of Justice. But what's important, you know, there is, in fact, it's a success story, because uh, we raised uh, twenty-seven million rubles, three hundred seventy thousand dollars in a matter of 96 hours. 18,000 Russians send us money. The median check was $8, 600 rubles. 18,000, and that suggests that, in fact, there are people in Russia who do, un who do value the freedom of speech. And you know, I was receiving messages uh, from all across the country, and people were writing, you know, just don't give up, just don't give up. It, it was, it was, you know, probably the best four days in my life, because I've never felt that, you know, that that's warmth and that support, and that's this, 
Uh, but that's. <laughs> but you're saying um, we are finished, you know, um, and this model of finishing off but the free know, press it's is. It's obvious that you know they uh, they will, won't stop. Of course, we no. want this, but they won't uh, stop. No, there no. will be something and, else. And 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 you're saying um, um, the authoritarian regime of the Czechist. Um, that's the that's a former KGB, and you're you're an. I mean, they, they, they changed their name several times. Of course, the secret services now they're called FSB, or and and you're you're an expert on that. But is it is it is it done? You think on purpose to to have a free press? Is that a way to establish an authoritarian? Um, uh, um, political system, do they do they on purpose silence any opposition press? Of course, yeah. yeah. Of course, you know they're control freaks. Yeah. And you know they do on they do exactly what helped them to control the country back in the Soviet times. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, and that model is that an example to a Central European former Soviet. Are you saying is that a sort of an, a model which got exported into Poland or Hungary, or is that, no, is that too easy to say? No, I don't think say? that you can export mm -hmm. this the, in, the, in that fashion. But you see, like in Hungary, in fact, you know, in one of the submissions, there was a very good piece on uh, Orban and football. F and football, very right. interesting, very interesting. One I of the submissions to the European Press Prize. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, um, no, but you know, we see that. Um, uh, there is rise of authoritarian politics in Hungary, and we do know that Urban and P Putin, they are pals. They mm -hmm. support each other. And we see that you know, there is rise of authoritarian politics in uh, Poland. Uh, Silvia, of course, knows this much yeah. better than I do. Uh, so, no, I, I don't think that they can export this model. But what's important that when you have you said that you had elections just recently, yeah, and 48% voted for uh, right-wing parties, right? So, and probably 52 uh, for left-wing parties. For yeah. left parties, so 4% where, where you nothing. put the middle part. The, mod, the error is, uh, you, you know, the statistical error is basically 3%. So it's nothing. So when you have the result which is on the margins, it's very easy to manipulate the votes. That exactly what we saw in the case of the presidential uh, elections, elections in, in the United States. Yeah. Now we understand, we know, you know, uh, if anyone, any of you interested, I can give you, you know, this, uh, the, uh, this, mm, the name of the book and, you know, you can get it on, the, on uh, uh, Amazon. It's badly written, but it's a great statistical study, it's pure academic study. So, and uh, you just name? understand how these works. You understand that, of course, you know, what's the most interesting now is who was on the ground. Because obviously there had to be some Americans. And we have, you know, there is a suspicion that, in fact, you know, Manafort, who was, uh, was passing uh, the outcomes of the uh, closed polls, was one of those who helped Russians to Manifold, direct this now, process. Now, uh, but also, accused. you know, yeah. this, uh, yeah. you know that when Russians hacked the emails of the head of the Clinton's, uh, Clinton's campaign, Podesta, a man in the emails, and they're idiots, of course, you know, not, not to protect their data. But anyway, so uh, don't do this, you know, protect your data. So, uh, but anyway, there were models, in these emails, uh, some, uh, some, uh, uh, some of the guys put down the models that Democrats were going to use exactly in these key swing states, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. So apparently Russians got to know. They knew, thanks to these uh, emails, they realize where were the weak points. And, and you're saying because of the small margins we of see course. everywhere in but all elections, but that's why it's it, so it matters. It, it, that's it, what matters. Yeah. When you have you know the, the the landslide victory, you don't care about you know uh, all this uh, cyber warfare. But when the, there is you know this, the outcome is on the margins, that's when you should be extremely concerned. And, and, and um, uh, 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 maybe last question, then going to to you too, um, but. Um, um, you saying there are only 
to 20, 30 independent political journalists left. Um, I'm just wondering, um, a, a very good friend of you, Boris Nemtsov, got killed. Other um, journalists get killed in, 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 yeah. in, in Russia. And we had the daughter of Boris Nemtsov in the same series you were in as, as a freedom lecturer here, explaining about her father, how, how, how what happened to him and how that, that happened. Um, it is a real possibility, um, and we just saw in the little movie three, a Bulgarian, a, a Slovak, and a Maltese journalist being killed in the Union, but this is about European journalism. I mean, Russia is within Europe. Um, don't, I mean, it's, it's terribly dangerous what you're doing. You know, I think that journalism, to be honest with you, I, I wouldn't exaggerate this. I think that journalism, in any case, quite a dangerous job. And you always have a choice. You have a choice to write about fashion, about, you know, flowers, you know, you can do lovely stories. Yeah. But if you decide to, if you go into political journalism, it's a dangerous thing to do. It's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's amazingly, you know, you're getting high each time you get a good story. <laughs> uh, but, but it's dangerous, yes? Isn't it true, Sylvia? Well, well, depends why you do it, I would say. <laughs> but, um, um, no, but, but uh, I understand what you're saying. It's, of course, if you unearth a great story, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful, and it's, it's, a, it's a great job, and it's very relevant. Um, I'm just wondering, isn't it a job which is becoming too dangerous uh, uh, to the east of the European Union? You probably want to ask, is it worth it, you know, uh, uh, is it worth it, you know, is it worth risking? Uh, maybe, maybe that's part of the question, yes, yeah. I think it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you for an understanding. No. I'm sure that is a grace too. <laughs> okay, um, um, uh, um, Sylvie Kaufmann, what, what do you, what do you uh, uh, make of this somber <laughs> um, uh, outlook on, on it? I mean, Yevgeny Albat says, you know, we're done for in a way because this is. And how are we going to prevent that going that, that happening in France or Germany or Poland or? Yeah, you know, uh, one one of the great things about the European Press Prize is that I get to to see Evgenia at least once a year, and every year it, our conversation gets more depressing. And <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, um, no, I mean, it is a somber landscape, I agree, and it's, uh, it's difficult and it's very challenging. And as you pointed out, it's also uh, dangerous. And, uh, and, and there I wouldn't compare, of course, journalism in Russia or journalism in France. No. I mean, no. no. Uh, and I, of course, for the first time uh, over the past two years, we've had journalists killed within the European Union. Yeah. And that's a first, and that's very, very worrisome. I agree. But these are countries, Malta, Bulgaria, Slovakia, where the rule of law is, I mean, should be implemented because they are members of the European Union, so legally they should, you know. But we know for a fact that there are problems. Yeah. And so... Um, the rule of law is weaker than in other yes, places. Yes, uh, yeah. and there's um, mafia more in those you know, the mafia is more powerful in those countries than it is in, in Northern Europe, I would mm -hmm. say. Or, so um, uh, I'm not saying that it's an excuse, but it's it's more dangerous to be a journalist in Slovakia or in Bulgaria than in France or, or in Britain, I would say. Um, now, is it worth it? Of course. And we can see that, um, I mean, a democracy, it, it, it sounds like a cliche, but a democracy cannot function without a free press, basically. So and 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 you were wondering why you were asking why no I, I mean Yevgenia was talk, talking about control freaks why why do they want to control the press if you're an authoritarian regime mm -hmm. because it's all about power if you have if you're an authoritarian regime you want to control the whole power and and if you have a, a press criticizing you it's just you know, it undermines your power, so you have to, to fight this free press and to control it. Um, so what is interesting is that 
there is resistance. I mean, you have Yevgenia uh, going on, but you also have in Poland uh, a very, very vigorous press, which is fighting and, and, and publishing and being read. And you, know, you can see that people um, uh, need this. Uh, they've tasted once. Once, once you've tasted democracy, it's uh, you don't forget this taste usually. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and and you know those people when you did this fundraising, these are people f for whom uh, uh, a free press matters. They understand how important it is. Um, Slovakia, look. Uh, so, uh, uh, th this young journalist was was uh, assassinated with his girlfriend. Uh, the, as you showed in the picture, uh, Robert Fitzo, the prime minister, had to go. He managed to put one of his puppets yeah. in power. Uh, but what happened a week ago is in the presidential election, a woman got, um, she's not elected yet, in but I think she's going yeah, to be elected. She won the, she won yeah. the first round. She's a lawyer who fought uh, corruption and who became uh, very active and well-known after uh, the murder of the journalist. So, you know, uh, things, societies do get mobilized, particularly in, in, in Europe, and I think it is very important. Look at, uh, I'm talking about Europe, look at Algeria. Um, what's going on in Algeria at the moment is very interesting and very important. Uh, so it's it's an authoritarian authoritarian regime with this president who is um, almost dead. We don't even know whether he's alive or not. Who doesn't, but who doesn't want to go? Yeah. yeah, he doesn't want to go. He's 82. He's uh, you know um, uh, he has a very very bad health, Bouteflika, and. Um, He's running for a fifth uh, term. So suddenly the, the citizens uh, uh, revolt and take to the streets and, and say they want a, a new system, a new regime, a change of system. And what do they want? Free press. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a fundamental element. So, And just one thing, uh, going back to um, the beginning of your statement, uh, Evgenia, about what happened 30 years ago. 1989, and we thought that it would be forever. And there's something which also happened in 1989. It's uh, the birth of uh, internet. And uh, I was a correspondent in the US in the 90s when, when the internet uh, became uh, available to most of us. And, and it was also a period of immense hope because it was a revolution, of course, and we all thought that the internet would be a force for freedom, for, uh, for knowledge, and that we basically saw it as a very positive force at that time. And now we, uh, <laughs> we have these you know, uh, problems with Facebook. We'll com come back to it, I'm sure, because it's so important. And social networks, which are perverting the, 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 free, uh, the, the, the mission of the free press and mm -hmm. information. So you know, we have this double backlash, in fact, which is quite uh, worrisome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, um. Dennis, the last question, or the first question, Evgenia Albert asked, you know, how are we going to prevent to that happening in, in Europe? There's, there's, the, there, there's the answer, of course, that if you murder Jan Kostniak, sure. you know, the, the Slovaks suddenly realize how important these matters are and maybe even elect you yeah. know, a, a lawyer who... So there's, there's that, of course, but you, do you see other... Um, I think, well, I think there's, there are different kinds of hostility towards journalists. There's obviously this, what we, we've been describing about the hostility of the state or state mm -hmm. forces. Or deep state. Or, or whatever. Yeah. There's also then partisan hostility. So uh, if, if say, uh, you know, the first time I experienced it physically was at a Sarah Palin rally. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in 2008 in America, where suddenly we, the journalists, felt threatened by the, by the crowd there. And this was unusual in Europe or in, in, in America at that time. And you see quite a lot of that now with uh, journalists in Britain, for example, being threatened uh, by, different, uh, you know, by different elements. But it's really, that's because you're not part of their partisan world. Mm -hmm. But there's another kind of uh, hostility which 
again, I think has, uh, has appeared much more recently. Uh, one of the things, if you're a foreign correspondent for a small newspaper, as I am, one of the things you spend a certain amount of your time covering is disasters, hurricanes, floods, <laughs> train crashes, terrorist attacks, whatever. And there's a certain kind of pattern traditionally. You always try to get there before the television people are there because uh, after the television people have been stamping around, they just annoy everybody and they piss everybody off. And so, uh, you know, so it, whereas if you're there early enough, people talk to you and they're kind of usually glad to, the, to talk to you. That was the way it was. But in 2017 in Britain, we had, there was a general election, but you also had four terrorist attacks and you had a fire in Grenfell Tower. And, and I noticed for the first time uh, that when we arrived, people didn't welcome us. And they thought mm -hmm. in a way that we were part of the problem. And so in a number of cases it was, you're just going to turn this into your formula story. You, you make this into a story. Then you know, there was one of the terrorist attacks was at the Finsbury Park Mosque. And it was uh, targeting the a right wing uh, fascist targeting the Muslims and the, uh, the people praying in the mosque, and uh, and there, the people were quite uh, you know resentful of the press because they basically said a lot of the stuff you've been writing, you collectively have been writing, has been feeding into this atmosphere. But the one that really struck me most was Grenfell Tower, which was this mm. fire in a, a big public building, <coughs> public housing, 72 people died. Mm. And when we went down there, one of the first things that people said was, we told you about this. They had been warning all the time. They'd been warning for years about uh, problems with the building, about uh, the fact that it was a fire trap. And nobody was listening, including us, including the, the, the mainstream media, in a sense. And the, and the people who had covered it best were the specialist press inside housing, which is basically for the housing industry. And what struck me there was that what these people felt was not so much that they hated us because they didn't agree with us, but we had let them down. We hadn't been useful to them. And one of the reasons, of course, is not entirely our fault, is that we've got no money. And, in, you know, and, years, uh, and years ago, when, say, you had a city paper and they had lots of reporters on uh, the beat, so one person was covering the city council and was, uh, you know, uh, was at the meetings, every single meeting that was there, somebody else was covering the police, all of this, you were able to watch everything. And the, the local newspaper provided a particular useful service for people like this. Mm -hmm. And so you saw the journalist and this was a welcome thing, this was an opportunity for your story to be told. Whereas now, increasingly they uh, do perceive us, or people sometimes perceive, perceive, perceive us as just ignoring them and then wanting to just turn their th experience, which is real, into one of our manufactured formulaic stories. And so I do think that if we want to to survive and to, you know, we really have to be, we have to be useful to people. What Yevgenia does in Russia and what people do in very extreme circumstances is clearly useful to people. It's necessary and useful. But I do think that we have to work out somehow, also as our business models are developing, some way of ensuring that actually we can stick with things, that we can stick with the story after uh, it's gone out of the headlines. But you're saying something uh, essential. Um, um, of course, it's not entirely our fault, you're saying, because we lack money to have reporters on the ground who uh, report on local issues. Yeah, but it's, at the same time, there is a question of priorities. So that, you know, mm -hmm. it's... Uh, I mean, one of the things, uh, one of the initiatives that won the uh, European Press Prize last year, I think, was the local, which was a kind of a, a network of trying to to find ways of doing local news in Britain, because all the local stations were closing, local uh, newspapers were closing, and trying to find some way of doing this cheaply and online. And I, and I, I, think, it, I think it's not just, I mean, certainly part of it is money, but also part of it is the way in which, uh, the way in which particularly sort of metropolitan, big national news organizations think about priorities and how they think about about people who are not very powerful and, uh, frankly, people who are poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe going a little bit deeper into um, uh, this uh, um, lack of money for quality journalism, and because, yes, there is this hostile environment um, coming from authoritarian politicians, 
um, there is maybe indeed this new phenomenon of the public being hostile to, to it, but there's to reporters or reporting arriving at some event, or even reporters, um, lobby journalists, journalists who report on their parliaments, on their um, as being part of the problem. Or, yes. But um, there's also, of course, the huge American firms who take away all the revenues of the yeah. of the big of uh, all the all the advertisement revenues of of, of the newspapers uh, uh, all over Europe. And uh, I don't think uh, the Irish Times and Le Monde are very different in that respect. Mm -hmm. That they lost huge amount of income out of because it flows to the stakeholders of Facebook who put them through our Zuid Os, our banks here in the in Amsterdam to the Cayman Islands and don't <coughs> pay much or no tax and, 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 and get away get away with it. Is that is that is that indeed still a, a, a huge problem or is that you know some I think it's a huge problem, but I do think that it's important to to uh, separate and identify these problems. The, the the Facebook and Google problem is uh, it's a, it's a social and political problem, and it's a problem for the economics of journalism. But at the same time, what we're all trying to do is actually to find a kind of post-advertising model, in a sense, where advertising is less than uh, you know is less uh, 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 an important part than it was. And so, for example, online subscriptions are working for a lot of uh, newspapers, uh, you know, including our paper, for example. So that, you know, it's I th I, but, I, but I do think that you know you can s you can certainly blame. Uh, the economic circumstances and blame these big tech companies for lots of things, uh, but I do think we need also, if we you know, if we're not just to, to go down complaining all the time, we need also to to work out why it is that people would have a justifiable criticism of us, and try to do something about it. Would you agree, Sylvie Kaufman, with that? Is it is it has it to do with the ethics of of journalists as well? Or is it? No, well, it's got to do with the mission of journalism. First, about the these um, internet giants, mm -hmm. Google, uh, Facebook, Amazon. Um, the tax issue is a real one, uh, and the re the loss of you know the lost revenues is uh, another real one. Yeah. yeah, but this is a political issue. That I mean, what is the EU for if we cannot solve this between ourselves? You know, and what do you mean between ourselves? Between the European, you know, it, countries. It's, yeah. Countries. Yeah. We, it, it is something which has to be solved at European level. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to do it so far. So that's uh, that's beyond. John. It, it's it it's a problem also for for media because you know mm -hmm. it's it, it it's a problem also for our business model. But but uh, you know overall it's it's a big political issue and it's a European issue. I think. I mean but, political. It's but even it, even but, even that yeah. solved on the European level, then there's no revenues left for Le Monde. No, no. I mean, if you know, it, we have to. So we don't need a Putin to put our quality journalism out of business. We have uh, five tech t tech firms who are doing no, it. No, no, yeah, <laughs> no. We have different, as, as as Denis said, we have different kinds of problems. This is an economic problem, mm -hmm. right? And then we have the problem of what we put in our um, papers or radios or or websites or, or and and. The, the mission of journalism and why we have lost the trust of our readers. Mm -hmm. That's because a different is, problem. Yeah, saying, this yeah. is exactly mm -hmm. what's happening. And I think both are separate. Of course, it's easier to it's easier to work for a newspaper if you don't have to worry too much about your revenue. And I don't know of a newspaper at the moment which doesn't have to worry about its revenues because it's really a very difficult time economically for, for, for the industry. But, um, you know, one of the reasons also, it's not only technology and business models, but also one of the reasons why we have been losing readers is also because we have been losing their trust or that the, this uh, link has been uh, broken. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly for the reason you, you described on, on, on that... Um, on that terrible uh, fire and the, and the, and, and the Granville Tower, yeah. Right. And we, um, I think we see this also with the Gilets Jaunes in, in France. Mm -hmm. um, the Yellow Vest. The Yellow Vest, yeah. 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 
Uh, it's been going on for four months now, so we're quite um, familiar with it now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, by, by the way, tomorrow is Saturday, so uh, it will be uh, the 19th Saturday <laughs> of demonstrations. And uh, but so it's 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 um, it's an important social phenomenon because at the beginning we realized that these are people who we don't cover. Very much, the or press enough. Doesn't cover enough. Yeah, that the mm -hmm. media, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, mainstream media, and or any media, and uh, that's one of the one of the You know, there there are several elements to this. There's the fact that some of us are elite media, and I think I can include Le Monde in this because we're a kind of establishment newspaper. Uh, but there's also the fact that the economic, one of the consequences of the collapse of the business model is what you said, the, the disappearance of local news and local newspapers or the weakening of local newspapers. And so journalists, uh, there, are, there are fewer and fewer um, reports, you know, closer to the readers. So they feel left behind economically and they feel left behind culturally. So, you know, in this anger which was expressed by people who are basically working poor, they are not unemployed people, they are not people from the uh, disenfranchised suburbs, they are people who, most of them have a job, you know, really the big majority of them have a job, but, mm -hmm. uh, but very low wages, yep. and it's, you know, they find it very, it's very difficult to make uh, ends meet. Um, and so suddenly, um, they find that they have to. There's a new tax, you know, uh, imposed on 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 um, petrol, uh, in the, for that matter, and it's just one too much, and yeah. then it erupts because in France it's that, the that's, way. That's that's very interesting. You're yeah. saying you're saying um, it's the working poor mm -hmm. who are not reported on, so they feel left alone yes. culturally because they don't have a newspaper covering their life, I their mean, problems. Not their only newspapers, they don't see themselves represented in TV, for mm -hmm. instance. This is something they said very much uh, during the first few weeks. Uh, first, one thing is that journalists were not welcome. You know, they, they first, at the, it's not only the demonstrations on Saturdays, it's in the cities, it's, it was the roundabouts that they were occupying. occupying yeah. And so journalists, reporters went to, to cover those, <laughs> to meet them in the roundabouts. And at the beginning, they were really uh, expelled. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were really not welcome, and they said you. Sort of the same system, Dennis was. Right. Same situation, Dennis yeah, was describing. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, so one of the grievances that they expressed was that they didn't have a voice in the media. They mm -hmm. were not represented, and I must say they have a point. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's true that suddenly we saw these people interviewed on TV screens. And you think, these people, we never see them. We haven't seen normally. them for no. many years. They're yeah. never, no. never maybe never. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you meet them in, uh, you know, in a super, uh, supermarket or if you live in a small town or you don't, n you don't meet them in the center of Paris because it's too expensive. They so what you're both them. saying, actually, mm -hmm. is that um, it maybe has to do with money because you don't have enough people on the ground, but it has to do with mentality of the press as well, this crisis, not covering big parts of the population who's just been out of yes sight. i think uh, i mean we do it we do it every when there's a, an election campaign <laughs> that's <laughs> that's mm -hmm. something we suddenly we remember that there are voters and we say oh my yeah we have to go to around france and in those areas where we never go to and so we do it every 5 years it's not very good mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so <laughs> Evgenia, please. may i ask you a question mm. New York Times has 4.5 million subscribers, of which 1.5 digital. Washington Post, I don't remember exactly, but something like about 3 million subscribers. Uh, the New Yorker, uh, this is the, 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 the weekly magazine with this long, long stories, 20,000 uh, characters 25, I mean, unbelievable, you know, just very, very long. Yeah, we have a subscription it of it here in the, in the cafe. Yeah, we, yes. yeah, we love it, but One I've never, uh, hardly any time to do it. 0.4 million subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you have explanation why they why? have such a huge 
subscription base? It's, it's actually gone down. It used Where? to be bigger. No, it's up. Yeah, I mean, uh, not New York Times is up. Uh, yeah, Washington but it's Post very recent because they've reacted. Well, the Washington Post is up, but they've been bought by by Amazon by Jeff Bezos. So it's it's uh, they've he's poured a lot of money in it. Uh, the business model broke down. Okay, so the advertising the the business model was based on uh, revenue from advertising and from circulation. That broke down because of you know new technology, publicity, uh, free 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 papers, uh, uh, all news TV channels. Anyway, several reasons, and um, and the New York Times, I think, well, I don't I don't want to speak for them, but but they reacted. They had a, a loss of circulation, quite spectacular, and they reacted very well. They invested uh, massively in digital um, technology and journalism, and and they have a big market also. They have a big market in English, you know. Um, I mean, you also publish in English, <laughs> but I mean, from you know, um, it's it 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 counts, and uh, I think. Many of us have done this too. Uh, in Le Monde, I must say, we, have, we were almost bankrupt nine years ago. We almost disappeared and we were bought uh, by private uh, businessmen and they injected a lot of money and we invested massively into digital um, uh, operations. And so now we're coming back to, uh, to financial stability. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. But and we have, you know, but but it's it's a, a constant fight. It's really an uphill battle. You have to innovate all the time. You cannot never rest. You know, you always have to to uh, watch your back. <laughs> it's much more difficult than it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. I'm think, afraid there's yeah. a, there's also a very um, easy answer to your question why um, they're doing better. Also because they're the last quality papers in the whole continent of North, in the whole United States. Mm -hmm. Because it used to have a quality paper in every town and they're out of business. So from every small town, there's a little bit going to the New York Times. It used to be the New York local paper. So um, um, if you compare it, what's been lost um, on the Boston Globe or on, on all sorts of, you know, the, the, the Birmingham Haber Herald or which were quite good mm. papers and they're all gone. So by that time, you know, if you have one left in a huge country, that one might survive. But then you have lost all the local papers who were quality newspapers. Actually. Right. So it's... It, <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, yeah. There's, um, I think also there's actually there's one, one of the... Um, uh, one of the advantages, actually, one of the upsides of the way things have gone with uh, online journalism is that if people are choosing what they pay for, they don't want to pay for something that's a commodity that they see everywhere, but they will pay for something which is a good, well-written, yeah. original piece. That's the New York and that's, also, yeah. There's yeah, a market yeah, for yeah. quality journalism. Yeah. And people don't mind paying. Yeah. And But coming a little bit back to that... Um, uh, um, mentality problem of not covering mm -hmm. and catering for the needs of working poor or uh, people or the needs of um, you know that there's, there's something we did uh, 2015 four years ago which uh, was a big lesson for me when we had the terrorist attacks in in Paris um, the Bataclan you know we mm -hmm. had 130 people killed we um, wrote what we called a memorial, which we decided, and, and the New York Times had actually done it in 2001, uh, for September 11, for the victims of September 11. Um, we decided to write the profile of every single victim, mm -hmm. but with, you know, not just a profile with the Facebook pages or when we went to interview the, their relatives or yeah. their closest yeah, friends. Yeah, journalistic and, work. Yeah. yeah, so it was a real uh, profile and we asked for a picture from the family mm -hmm. and so on. This, it was, it was difficult of course and uh, you, we appealed to, for volunteers in the newsroom and we ended up with, uh, I think I counted that 78 journalists took part in that, in, in that operation, in this memorial, which is still in, on our website. Mm -hmm. Le Monde journalists? Yeah. 78. 78 took part, volunteered to do it, yeah, including people who, you know, like for instance, the, the theatre critic or people who wouldn't usually do this kind of uh, reporting, but so um, it was a big collective effort. 
I mean, the response from the readers was just incredible. It was like they were discovering what a newspaper could be before you know mm -hmm. what what mm -hmm. was the purpose of uh, um, of journalism and and I mean it, uh, it it's true that if you, uh, you 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 spoke about doing something useful right or yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it is rewarding if you do if you uh, cover things which are useful or which uh, create a link with between the readers and the journalists I think you can try to rebuild trust. This mm -hmm. is a way. I mean, uh, so of course, fortunately, we don't have terrorist attacks uh, every, all the, time. All the yeah. time, so we don't have to do this. But I'm sure, you know, this. I, when I said it was a lesson, I realized that this link with the readers, we had lost it, and it was very important. So, um, and, and the, the, the lesson from the Gilets Jaunes uh, episode is also uh, the same lesson. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or more or less, yeah. Mm. That's a very, that is a severe criticism on the quality press in Europe, actually, if it's also a mentality thing. That well, I think, it's, I, mean, I think it's two things. I mean, it is, it is also, obviously, local uh, media should cover local areas. So, sure. I mean, and Because you, know, you actually do have this phenomenon, say, with, in Brexit, as you do in Trump uh, world, that uh, people are constantly visiting the ugliest towns in England and uh, finding wherever, uh, you know, some seaside town which voted 78% Brexit or, you know, and interviewing people with Union Jacks on their foreheads and all, you know, and there's, so there's a kind of, a sort of a porn, a, a misery porn about all these uh, terrible places. Uh, but that's not really doing anything useful for them and it's just using them in a sense as entertainment. But I, I think it's, it's more... Uh, it was really in response to what we were talking about as to like, how do we protect ourselves mm -hmm. from what's happening yeah. from above and everywhere else. And one of the things is, I think, to think in terms of how useful we are for our society and for the people who uh, mm -hmm. depend on us. No, 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 that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, understood. And it's, I, actually, it's, uh, I think, uh, an important insight, especially if you look, indeed, on what's happening to the, to the movement of the Yellow Vests and how they present themselves and their grievances, mm -hmm. and grievances, indeed, in, you know, in Holland. And, in, and actually, grievances this week about the coverage of the electorate of Baudet, had the same, they had the same mm -hmm. sort of grievances mm -hmm. uh, about the press. I mean, um, for right reasons or wrong reasons, but um, they have. Yeah, they... Mm -hmm. um, 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 Silly, we, we, we ask you to, to, maybe you've covered a lot of that ground yeah. already, <laughs> but we ask you to, um, to whether, you know, to reflect a little bit on European press and its challenges. And uh, I know you prepared something, maybe you've covered yes, some of it. Uh, or, or but um, what else can I... Um yeah, there was, there was something... Uh, um Talking about the Gilets Jaunes, there was something I wanted to mention also. It's, um, it's the role of Facebook and of Russia today in that, pro in that movement. We found out it was uh, something we, d we didn't suspect at the beginning. Of, well, first, um, one characteristic of the Gilets Jaunes uh, movement was the way they were able to mobilize, to, to um, you know, they, they set up anger groups on Facebook. And, and there's a new algorithm. Who's, who in, set them up, these anger groups on Facebook? They, they themselves, I mean... The Gilets Jaunes. The, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the Yellow Vest, they started to organize locally through groups on Facebook. And they were called Groupe de Colère, yeah, uh -huh. anger yeah. groups. Yeah. And, um, and the way they accelerated or intensified that, this mobilization uh, through locally was because um, Facebook last year set up a new algorithm that um, facilitates um, um, groups or circulation or, or how would I say, um, you know, it's not through the national media that you can um, uh, constitute those groups. It's more through your friends or local yeah. local sources, yeah. Yeah. and so um, that was a factor in the mobilization of of, of the gilets jaunes. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing which is uh, quite interesting, and the other thing we found out was that um, um, uh, 
Russia Today, uh, this so the, this Russian state uh, media uh, had a role in disseminating had a very active role in disseminating the news about the protests themselves and the violence and the clashes. Mm -hmm. And um, and we hadn't, you know, Russia Today in France, it, the French version of Russia Today is fairly recent. Uh, I think it's uh, it was uh, in 2017 it was set up in France. And at the beginning, I remember I watched it, when it started, I watched it for a week a whole week, because I thought, you know, what are they going to do? What is going to be the effect of it? And and to me, after a week, I thought, well, it's pretty irrelevant because it was so much propaganda on Syria, on Russia, on Putin. On, so, you know, I thought, who's going to buy this in France apart from a, a small minority? So it will not be really uh, effective. But then came this crisis of the Gilets Jaunes and suddenly uh, Russia Today started to uh, put on their website and on YouTube these videos of violent clashes 24 hours a day, all the time, and it became viral. And I think, you know, now there have been studies which have been done and, and it sh they showed that um, the effectiveness of this was pretty important. So, um, that tells you something also of about what we're up against in democracies. It's, um, I mean, I think we have to be very careful about um, how we deal with information, where it comes from. Uh, fake news, of course. We've we've been talking about fake news since Trump made it famous, but it is a real phenomenon. And so now we are in, 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 in Le Monde, for instance, we have been thinking about how to fight it as uh, several media. And we set up a fact-checking department, as a lot of us do. It's called uh, uh, Le Decodeur. And, and we have also a software that we put up, which is called Decodex. You can integrate it to your Mm -hmm. uh, to the site of Le Monde, and there it's you know it helps you to check facts and and it's good. I mean, it's working well. It's interesting, and some uh, I think a lot of people use it, but it's not uh, it, it's not enough. The other thing we've we've um, said I think is which is crucial, and we're working on this. It's media literacy. Uh, we have to teach teenagers uh, um, how to use the media, how to use the internet, how to identify sources, how to, you know, how to tell a fake news from a real news. You have to learn this from uh, very early. And so we have volunteer journalists, we have uh, set up an association with the Agence France Presse, mm -hmm. and uh, we have volunteer uh, journalists from Agence France Presse and from Le Monde who go to schools, in, in high schools and middle schools, and, you know, uh, tell uh, students, young students, how basic principles, you know, they take them through their smartphone and they say, look, this is, if you see this, this is obviously going to be fake or, you know, very, very basic things. But if, if you are not told, if your first contact with information is uh, through fake sites or, mm -hmm. or propaganda or, and you don't know where it comes from, you know, you, you, you're going to believe it. How, how are you going to exercise your mm -hmm. critical uh, uh, mind, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, this is, I think, media literacy and education is, is a very, very important tool in this respect. But there we have to be, of course, very precise, because mm -hmm. if you talk about fake news, um, um, you have also different opinions of news, huh? which um, is a different thing than fake news, of mm -hmm. course, because you can interpret uh, things like this or like that. Um, and then there's but this something, something even basic like a picture. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pictures circulating on, on 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 social networks, and some of them are for from four years ago. Yeah. And they are supposed and they are presented to you as you know that was yest in yesterday's demonstration, and it's incendiary. It's yeah. it can be very very uh, um, uh, very negative. So there are ways also. You know. Yeah. If, 
to tell to tell young people, look, this is it's not because you're seeing it on your screen on of your smartphone that it's true. But then last, yeah, then so, but that's something yeah. we could actually do something about in the sense that if we, the the rest of the media, the legacy media, whatever, if if I'm sorry, uh, that, I, I, that's something that we could do something about in, in the sense that there's no reason why some kind of protocol for identifying the data photographs. Mm -hmm. You know, which we don't yeah, do either. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't mm -hmm. do something like that. Mm -hmm. But but um, last week uh, in Russia there was a, a, a law introduced about fake news, where um, the Russian government says that you can be fined for spreading fake news. Um, that's to be decided, of course, by the Russian government. So by now they have the ideal means of telling what's fake or isn't fake. Um, and there are people, of course, who um, are very much afraid that the Union, with their mm -hmm. discourse on fake news, will do the same, the European Union, by telling you which is true and which is not. I mean, it's a but problematic it, discourse. Wait a second, it's very important that in Russia it's, it's an extrajudicial uh, affair. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, and the, the, the procedures, the falling, yep. then some are, it's just not just one law. In fact, there were four laws, but anyway, Two of the most important about the fake news, and then uh, another uh, law that you, uh, you know, for criticizing uh, unfairly authorities. Yeah. So you yeah. cannot really criticize them, you know. The government. If tomorrow yeah. I decide, I would say that Putin is a moron, you know, they will find me, even mm -hmm. though I will still still going to say <laughs> this. <laughs> but anyway, because he is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, but uh, the problem is that the whole procedure doesn't allow for any court hearings. You cannot protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Just some, bureau let's say, some bureaucrat in a region, he uh, will read something about he himself, yeah. and he doesn't like it. Then he calls the procurator of, the, of this territory and says, you know, there is this uh, fake news. No. So and you, then you, all, and then he just procurator writes a paper, yeah. or calls a you know a local special agency, and that's it. And they block the site. It's not just about fine; they block you. Yeah. Now, you, so you're making an, an important um, uh, um, um, distinction that it's um, uh, extrajudicial. There's there's no rule of mm -hmm. law in which you can test it. Of course, that's a big difference in in a in a state. But it's this. I mean. There is, of course, a fear uh, among uh, many voters within Europe that Brussels will decide what is fake news or what's not. Is that legitimate or is that is that? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't see Brussels deciding on this. I mean, it, no, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, but we have. We have passed a law in France about fake news last last uh, in last November, mm -hmm. um, and there's some. Op I mean, it's been voted by both the Senate and the National Assembly, so it's been democratically passed. Uh, there's no point about it, but it's been criticized by some uh, people and and very much on the left, of course, and some, but some. Not so much in the media, a, li a little bit in the media, but you know, it's uh, it gives a definition of fake news, which is pretty wide, and it will be um, up to the judge to decide whether he can ban. It's 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 about fake news during an election campaign. It's not yeah. all the time. It's during yeah. election three months uh, before an election. Um, and it will be up to the judge to decide whether this yeah. one should be banned or not. So, you know, uh, I think it <laughs> takes some time before. And, and in a democratic system, you trust the judges to do their job properly. So mm -hmm. it's very different. You can have, um, I think, if Brussels ever passes a law on, on fake news, you know, I don't think in, in the Netherlands or in France or... Or, or in Belgium, it will be too much of a problem. It might be in Italy at the moment, you may say, for instance, or in, or in Hungary. But they already have their system, which is, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, um, it's not Brussels' problem at this stage. It's more of a, how every but country organizes But on the other hand, maybe, maybe it should, because I've been presented a presentation earlier this week mm -hmm. in which, and I'm going to argue for the other side, of course, um, where um, 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 there were screenshots of 
um, uh, pictures on the internet which told um, the viewer that this was happening in France and they checked it they checked the photos yeah. and the photos were from Chechnya the photos were from uh -huh, all yeah. over Europe and some of them were from France but most of them weren't uh -huh. and there were um, uh, tweets in Russian in French in uh -huh. Spanish in Slovak in Polish and posted the same second by bots uh -huh. by bots who've been and I saw the presentation by bots who've been posting these uh, these tweets and these Facebook uh, announcements by the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah. By the hundreds of thousands. I saw the statistics, and that was from. And they only had a measurement from 18 December till now. And some bots posted hundreds of thousands of pictures who were fake. Yeah. Fake news. <laughs> yeah, but then what we should do? And they mm -hmm. they were pushing that into the yeah. anger chambers of the yeah. of the gilets jaunes, yeah. and the and the amount of the effect is. Amazing. Yeah. You can meet the eff you can you can measure the effect. Yeah. So it does exist, of course. So shouldn't we outlaw it? That's that's I mean uh, or should yeah. we are we not too lenient on then, I mean is there a free speech for bots, mm -hmm. for instance? I agree, but then what we should do at European level is to have uh, uh, to have a better defense on cyber security. Okay. Mm -hmm. This you know, I think there's a big technological problem there and we sh we have to address it and we that's really where the European Union is important because we cannot properly address it individually, by state by state. This is really a security concern that we have to to uh, address together. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there? There should be something like pop-up window mm. yeah. that should get up and you know right. This is fake news. You know, this is be aware. No, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, yeah. if you decide to give this in the hands of the bureaucracy. Then welcome back to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, Orwell, 1984, <laughs> Minister of Truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, but who's gonna have the pop up? Who's gonna make the pop up? Yeah. You know, you, you, you know, that should be, you know, some companies, software companies, uh. who are involved in cybersecurity. You know, the, yeah. there's a, there should be, you know. Uh, Outsourced to, to the private companies, but don't allow government to do this. Except huh? that if you have, uh, Dennis, like Dennis. The, say the example that Yuri was talking about, if you have some footage of something that really did happen in Chechnya, and you then are, you push it in somewhere where it's, it, it's somehow, it's suggested that it's uh, the gilets jaunes. It's a lie, obviously, but mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, I just, I, 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 do, I, really, I, I think I would be with uh, Evgenia on this one, that I think I would err on the side of freedom of expression and hope, you know, to try to work out ways for the public exactly. to kind of be, exercise their judgment. But Because uh, I do think that, uh, you know, like the bureaucracy at the moment in Brussels is <laughs> relatively benign, you know, but uh, in some ways. It's busy um, with Brexit. I see, I, I see that point. I say, of course, I mean, uh, welcome back yeah. to, the, to the Soviet Union. But... Yeah. but, but um, but maybe um, um, maybe the press needs to transform itself in tech firms to check these. You're just suggesting we should be checking. But, but except, well, um, the, there is another issue, of course, which is that if uh, if we publish anything in our newspapers, we are responsible for it, legally responsible mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. in terms right. of defamation, in terms of uh, of everything else. And these big tech companies are not responsible for anything yeah, because right. they yeah. they You're claim right. not to be publishers. And right. that's a much more yeah. fundamental issue that these people who make the money out of it and who actually do put the thing there, they ought to be responsible for what they publish. Yeah. Like like you are responsible yeah. for what you publish. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they're the not Irish a utility. Times. They're not like the electricity company. So, 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 I, so they, I, they, I, they're not measured to the same. They're not, not to responsible to the same. I give you, a, you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, I took part in a radio program in France, and so it was advertised on Twitter as they always do, and uh, with the names of the four participants in the radio program, yeah. uh, four guests. Yeah, and you were one of the guests. Yeah, yeah, and out of those four guests, three had Jewish-sounding names. Okay. Possibly Jewish sounding names. Yeah. Uh, so um, and and so I was included in this in this um, announcement. So you know, with my Twitter address, so I got all the reactions of the, yeah, all the comments. Them, yeah. 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 And very quickly, about a dozen of them were anti anti-Semitic comments. Because this, some of the because, names sounded Jewish. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was I found it really offensive. I mean, it is illegal. 
mm -hmm. to make anti-Semitic attacks in France. Uh, Le Monde would never do that, of course, because it is illegal, and we, we wouldn't publish comments by our readers uh, right. You know, if, you put, if you put an article on and right. it's comments, you would right. not publish. We even the moderate the, you know, the comments mm -hmm. uh, to, mm -hmm. to to avoid this and all this. Okay. So Twitter, I mean, those those uh, reactions are on Twitter. So I reported them to Twitter. Yeah. Okay. And Twitter answered, "This is not in violation of our rules." Okay. So, so, so you would say that the, the but the, the so double standards, double as you standards, say. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we should treat these big internet firms as publishers. Well, you know, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Why shouldn't Quite they off. be responsible if we have to they behave get all the responsibly? Yeah, exactly. They got all, they got a lot of benefits. Uh, they're in the billions. Yeah. Yes, in the Cayman Islands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> which is quite a benefit. Yeah. Um, okay, um, uh, Dennis, we we ask you to reflect on on, on on the situation in Europe and maybe a little bit on Brexit, Brexit. because you're covering yes. it all uh, at the moment uh, almost uh, maybe 20 hours a day. Um, but maybe um, you've covered a lot of ground as well, but I would want to give you the possibility. Yeah, just very briefly about Brexit. I, 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 this is actually, thank you very much for having me, because it's very nice to talk about something other than Brexit. For one <laughs> night. Uh, I've just come from the European Council in Brussels, and so Brexit is... Uh, my entire life. Uh, Brexit, by the way, is bad for Britain and bad for Ireland, but it's good for newspapers in both countries. And, <laughs> uh, and readers are interested in it for whatever reason. But uh, the, uh, Theresa May, on Wednesday evening, she made this televised statement to the public where she uh, presented herself as being uh, the champion of the people against Parliament, and she uh, you know, was persuading the public that the MPs were getting in the way of, of delivering her Brexit deal. And apparently in Downing Street they had done some polling and they had found that actually this message among some voters is quite uh, persuasive. They do think that the MPs are getting in the way of doing this. And, uh, but the problem, of course, was that uh, she didn't have to persuade the public. The only people she had to persuade were 650 people in Westminster who are the MPs that she was insulting. And these MPs uh, are very tired. Everybody, I work there in the Palace of Westminster, and everybody is exhausted. They're uh, overwrought emotionally. A lot of the uh, MPs are getting threats. Uh, some of them quite serious death threats where prosecutions have ensued. And, uh, and every day when you walk in through there, you're walking past all these demonstrators from both sides, uh, you know, most of whom are fine and quite good humoured and everything. But it's, you know, this thing has been going on a long time. MPs are going crazy, and then the Prime Minister tells them that it's all their fault. And so, uh, you know, but it's also a kind of, it's, you know, but it struck me when I was looking at that, and then also there was a photograph you may have seen which came from the summit last night of all these, uh, there were actually mostly mm. EU diplomats gathered round and this was them, somebody had a laptop and they were typing up the draft of whatever the timetable for Britain to get out of Europe was going to be. And it was all the irony, here was Mrs May sitting in a room, her dinner served to her on a tray because she couldn't be at the meeting. And here's with this small group and they were doing it. And in fact, the interesting thing, one of the curious things about Brexit is that for, uh, uh, for something which was supposed to be a popular revolt against the elites, the actual doing of Brexit is entirely an elite project, and not only an elite, but a tiny elite. It literally is 650 people in uh, Westminster, and even within that, only some of them count. And uh, in the same way, it's a small number of people, leaders and bureaucrats, in, around Europe. And so this thing which uh, we somehow imagine as being this uh, cry of pain from the left behind or whatever has actually turned into, the execution of it has turned into the most elite project that has ever happened in politics in Britain. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I'm, one of the things though uh, from covering Brexit. I arrived in London just a few months before the referendum, and so it has been mostly what I've been doing all the time. And one of the things that I sort of realize is that uh, I, I think I understand uh, what I didn't know about it uh, a lot better now. Uh, and part of the reason, in a way, is that it's only after they made the decision to, let, uh, to leave that they started to think about it. 
And this is where uh, the newspapers came in. And the newspapers in Britain, the media, uh, weren't particularly great during the campaign. But actually, mostly they've been pretty good since. And so people in Britain have learned more about the European Union in the last three years <laughs> than in the 40, the 40 before. They know, for example, you know, uh, what, how uh, you know, supply chains for factories work. They know, all, you know, they know how, what a difference having custom checks mean. And of course, they know about the, uh, the border in Northern Ireland and in Ireland and, uh, and what a big difference uh, both Ireland and Britain being part of the European Union has made to the peace in Northern Ireland. And being an Irish correspondent reporting on Brexit in London is a kind of curious experience because on the one hand, I'm an outsider, but I'm working in there, I'm in the parliamentary lobby. And also, of course, Ireland is at the center of, uh, of the story. Uh, where, you know, where this thing is concerned. And looking back now to three years ago and how we perceived the referendum, it, was, it has been consistently thought of as being really these poor white people in forgotten parts of England who rather like the people we imagine were the people who voted for Trump, that they, uh, that they were suddenly making themselves known. But of course, in fact, it was a coalition. The other half of the coalition was conservative, rather rich people. So there were old conservative poor people and old conservative rich people. And they, and, but, but nobody really speaks very much about, you know, we don't go and do our big features down in Seven Oaks or in, some, uh, in somewhere in Surrey. We go to Boston, Lincolnshire or to, uh, to Bradford and talk about this. And in a way, that also, I think, misunderstands what actually Brexit was about. And so when we try to understand what it was, we think it was, uh, you know, it was an insurrection. It was an assault on experts, on the elites, uh, on the, uh, the governing class. It was about immigration. And, uh, you know, and, and that this was it is essentially what it was. And, they, and the people who planned Brexit, the Brexiteers themselves, have internalized this narrative, this idea that somehow it was actually a, a, you know, an, an anti-elite insurgency. But in fact, it was something else altogether as well. Uh, and so the, you know, the fact is that Britain was never a comfortable member of the European Union. It never enjoyed being there particularly. In a way, for most of our countries, joining the European Union was an opportunity either to get away from conflict or, in the case of a country like Ireland, to go from being poor to being quite rich. Uh, whereas for Britain, as one of the uh, most pro-European politicians there said to me once, for us, he said, it was an admission of defeat. And, uh, and they've always taken that with them. Uh, and, and so I think you know, it was a moment and it was a kind of a spasm. But at the same time, there's nothing in a way that much that they feel they can do about it. They kind of are going through with it. And again, the other thing, just another thought with regard to perhaps how we've reported it not as well as we should have. We always somehow, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the politicians and to some extent the journalists are afraid of the people, of those ordinary poor people. And, they, and because they're afraid of them, uh, they imagine that they have very intense and very angry feelings all the time. <laughs> But in fact, the intensity of feeling on Brexit is just as much on the other side. And uh, tomorrow, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people marching and demonstrating in London to remain in the European Union. And when you speak to them, they feel as if a big part of their identity, their European identity, is being ripped away. Uh, and meanwhile, you had this march that Nigel Farage organized the other day from Sunderland, which was billed as the great Brexit March, a uh, two week march, and on the first day there were 115 people on it, and on the second there were 77, and on the third there were 60. And yet, they're the people everybody's afraid of somehow. And so, so I think uh, you know, it, it's been a, a, a curious experience, but the main experience of it is really of trying to report on a governmental system having a nervous breakdown in front of you, and that's what seems to be happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very a nervous breakdown of uh, the government in front of you. It's, it's, I mean, it's exciting reporting, of course. It certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it happens once in a lifetime as a political journalist, of course. Yeah. Um, 
though the outcomes might be disastrous, well, maybe it's not. It's just completely unpredictable. And what is it extraordinary is that you know, you do like what you know because of being the way the Westminster lobby works. You all work together. You've got desks next to each other. You go to the same briefings. You you talk to each other all the time. And so there is a kind of a there would be a certain conventional wisdom early in the morning on Monday. And that then is entirely overturned by lunchtime. And then by six o'clock, it's gone in some other different direction. And this is all because of these unexpected happenings as well as just, you know, uh, you know if it was a, a, a sort of a soap opera, mm -hmm. the cliffhangers are just so good. And the, the, the plot twists, <laughs> they're really, uh, they're amazing. It's, it's better than House of Cards, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, um, you think there is a possibility of the rupture being so harsh that the bloodshed is going to uh, come back to Northern Ireland, to the border? I don't think that's likely, but it's possible. I think that, uh, I think the, 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 let me put it a different way. The reason that the Irish government is so, uh, was so uh, determined that they should get a guarantee that the border should remain open uh, there's a few reasons. One of the reasons that they're worried is that they, it's a very simple thing. They think that if, uh, even if you just put up a camera, a small camera to watch cars going up and back, uh, over and back, somebody's going to shoot the camera down. And then somebody's going to have to put up another camera. And what if somebody shoots him? Mm. And then who do you put to protect him? Do you put police? But if the police are attacked, then maybe you have to have soldiers. And so this is the uh, this is really what people worry about. That you know there's there's still a small residual element of dissident Republicans who are violent, and they've had a couple of little bombs late, lately. One of them actually reasonably big bomb, but you know they're they're not terribly effective. But you know the fact is that as soon as something happens, the, some, you know the thing escalates. But the other part of it is that actually what has happened since the Good Friday Agreement is that the border disappeared, mm. and people's lives. You know, I, I, where uh, you know, it didn't really matter. Like one of the the issues of the one of the things that, Nor that the Good Friday Agreement brought in was that if you're in Northern Ireland, you can choose to be Irish or British or both. And so, for people who thought of themselves as Irish, they didn't need to have a United Ireland because it made no difference. You just mm -hmm. went across the border; and everything was more or less the same. Whereas now, suddenly. Uh, they would find themselves, you know, their identity in some way uh, under threat is what they would fear. It's one of the nice features of the European Union that it brings peace. Yeah. Yeah. So if you leave it, there might be so different dangerous. problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm saying as a historian, <laughs> but um, thank you uh, all three very, very much for this round, uh, round the table. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there are people here in the audience who have questions, remarks, um, questions prefer preferably uh, on this um, conversation, this unique conversation, I would say, between three journalists with long, long standing experiences from all over the continent. Um, like I said, we're just trying to have a conversation. I, don't, I hope we've shed light on sort of the many, many different problems of journalism. I don't think we came up with much solutions, but that's not the, that wasn't the point of this rond de table. It's, the point was more uh, talking about uh, what stage and what what moment we're in in for Euro European journalism. We could have talked about endless endless uh, um, uh, topics because European journalism is covering all topics in the continent. But I'm very very glad that we came to some new insights. I think about also the crisis in journalism about covering um, certain parts of population about internet, about authoritarian regimes, about um, um, about the, the economics of it, and, and, was, and about the Brexit. Yeah, and then, <laughs> is there anybody who um, is wondering to, oh, okay, please come in, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. I am curious to hear a little bit about some of your ideas regarding solutions. Um, I'm so happy that the topic of local journalism came up. There are very strong parallels to the rise of local news deserts in, in the US. So I'm wondering in what ways you see a potential comeback for local news, and if not, how can the ties between the New York Times, the Le Mans, the Guardians of the World, uh, how can the ties between those newspapers and local communities be strengthened? 
Mm-hmm. So anybody who has any, well, I think I think there are actually, so there are some models actually of uh, of uh, of good, uh, n- relatively new online uh, local news services, and some of this is to do with pooling resources and uh, you know, but most of them are on a, on a pretty small scale. But then, you know, they are uh, you know they are local. There's a problem in Britain where the BBC uh, local radio network. Uh, it makes it quite difficult for uh, for others to compete with it, and it's got a lot of state funding. And so that's so just so in terms of just the commercial side of it, it's quite difficult. And a lot of uh, local newspapers have closed down. But I, but I think I think there are uh, models, but unfortunately they're probably not going to be uh, about keeping the old local newspaper going. I think it probably is going to be uh, a rather smaller scale, bottom up thing. But, but it, is, uh, it is crucial if you want people to have a connection to the, to the news that they, mm-hmm. as Sylvia was saying, they see themselves there. Uh, you mentioned the radio and it's interesting because in France, in, um, in surveys about trust, uh, readership, um, audience, the, the trust of the readers or the audience towards the media, the radio is the highest one. Yeah, um, the TV is the one which lost m- mm. most trust, definitely. Uh, but the radio mm-hmm. is, is keeping. Yeah, is on the top, and then there's uh, newspapers. Mm. Um, so radio, and and we do, for instance, in France, there are the public radio has yeah. a strong network of local radios. So um, this is probably a way we we should. Uh, we should work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Anybody else yeah. wants to join in? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this inspiring panel. Um, and in contrast with the local journalism angle, which is of course very important, and you probably have seen many of these throughout your work as the European Press Prize judges as well over the last years. I was wondering that if you see it as a problem or maybe even as a strength for European journalism that there are so many national media which obviously have national angles when talking about Europe or maybe cross-border angles, for instance, in Ireland, of course. Or do you, would, you, would you argue that there's a definite, definite need for a pan-European hmm. journalism hmm. paper, outlet, media, cross-border corp, uh, co- uh, cooperation across Europe, especially during election time. And why do you think there's not a true pan-European oh. media yet? Oh, that's a wonderful question, but um, I've been uh, grappling with it for years. Um, and there's one big problem in Europe for this. We have different languages. And I thought at some stage we could have a pan-European uh, media in English, but it's not so easy. Uh, I think we all like to read news in also, I mean, even those who read uh, English language uh, media, but we also like to read in our own uh, national yeah. language. So um, we, we have, uh, at Le Monde, we have a cooperation between six newspapers that we've done, we do once in a while. Um, some Some periods we do it more intensely and then Lately, it's been very loose because everybody was so busy with its with its domestic issues. Uh, so it's the Le Monde, the Guardian, the Deutsche Zeitung, La Stampa, um, it used to be El País, now it's La Vanguardia, and Gazeta Wyborcza in Poland. And um, it, it's very nice when we get together and we discuss about journalism and what we are going. You know, we 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 put up some supplements together, or we do joint interviews or joint investigations, and it we can see that there's a common journalistic European culture. It is true. We have no problems discussing among ourselves about the content, about who we want to interview, about you know the angles. It's 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 quite interesting. But then when we do it and we have to go all these translations, it's, uh, it's expensive and, and it takes time. And, you know, so it's a big obstacle. And, and then I must say, because of Brexit, so the Guardian started to say, oh, we are completely focused yeah. on Brexit. There's not so much appetite for European news. Then uh, the Spain had his Catalan crisis. Then, uh, of course, also Poland had its crisis. So, uh, I think there's, <laughs> another, problem. I think there's yeah. another problem, too, which is actually that people in different countries like different kinds of 
news story, different kinds of journalism. So there's a kind, you know, so it's it's everything from the way it's written, from the uh, you know the, the kind of the style of the thing, that that makes it sometimes quite difficult. And in all of these uh, various cooperations, one of the problems was that sometimes it all seemed a bit flat because. You know, just people, yeah. you know, once it was all translated, people just didn't enjoy it in a way. And there's another uh, reason, I think, just say for small countries, if I think, say, about Ireland, one of the reasons that we in the Irish Times have a network of foreign correspondents is because otherwise we would get our news from the UK or from the United States in English. And yeah. the fact is that in, say, Europe, Ireland has. You know, we were very close to Britain, but we had a different uh, foreign policy. We weren't in NATO. We also, we were in the Euro, they were not. And so th there are certain kinds of distinct outlooks that you have, and it's useful to have your own person mm -hmm. covering those things. But uh, the other thing I would say is that there are actually, of course, pan-European papers for the elites, which would be the Financial Times yeah. or you know, mm -hmm. the Economist. Which yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, I, I mean, there's, I think there's, uh, there's a need for something um, pan-European, but it's, uh, we have to find a business model. Uh, that's another thing. The adverti we also thought that we could uh, have uh, joint advertising for the six newspapers if we did that together. But no, the advertising market is completely fragmented. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, you know, uh, we didn't have a business model either. I mean, we're still going, we're still doing, for instance, for the European election, we're going to do uh, um, things together, yeah. I think we're looking for the last question. Um, on my end. Uh, hi, I uh, have a question about, we're talking about how Google and Facebook are curating and damaging the advertising model. And I was wondering what you think about the huge investment of, uh, Sorry, funds that Google is putting back into journalism. Is it uh, hypocritical? Is it time that they do this? Should news uh, papers and newsrooms accept this money? We do. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we have limited. We have some cooperation with them, and it's it's working well. I must say, um, they are they are very. Uh, honest about it, and we are. To, I mean, it's a good, it's a good uh, partnership, but it's very focused. It's on some some operations. We do mm -hmm. get uh, ads from Google, and in fact, these are the only ads we get because uh, Russian businessmen they're afraid to give us ads as uh, to give us ads. It means to to support Russian opposition against Putin. Um, but these are peanuts. There's a very small money, but you know, I really, would, you know, what I was, I've been thinking that we have been talking about all this fake news, and we never said that freedom of speech it is a real important value, and it's very. I'm always concerned that when we, uh, when we are talking about how to stop this fake news and how to punish these technological companies, it's, it, it's dangerous. It's dangerous that we can impair this freedom of speech. After all, it's really important that people have the possibility to get their voice out there because with the Convenient uh, uh, with the, with the, all these you know newspapers and TV networks and radio etc. Only very limited experts, politicians, they do have access to media. So as much as uh, we can be angry about Twitter and Facebook and Google, let's face it, these are. These companies, they gave voice to millions and millions of people who didn't have that voice before. And that's important. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Because otherwise, media uh, become the venue of, you know, the creme de la creme, you know, of the elites. So therefore, uh, I'm absolutely aware that you know that uh, Europe will find you know the balance, mm -hmm. but we should be very, or you should be very careful, 
uh, not to, in Regu Russian there regulate. is a saying not to throw the baby with the water. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. We, see the, we say the same. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not to throw out the baby with the water. After yeah. all, and you the, know, this continent paid with huge price, with millions of lives, for those, you know, human values and freedom of speech is one of those, one of the most important values that we really have. Freedom of speech is one of the most important babies to stay in the same <laughs> uh, matter of speaking uh, we have, uh, and that's very, very important to mm -hmm. remember. Um, and it's, I think, the core message of a free press and of a European press prize and of journalists, yeah, and where, yeah, where it's, yeah. is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it, because it's about everybody's freedom to be able to speak out, and not only the elites, and everybody in the country. Right. On the other hand, it would be nice if those firms would pay their taxes <laughs> and would be held responsible to the same measurements that other journalists are held responsible. And thank you all very, very much for this <laughs> round you. and for speaking out here, for being here. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. 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 I'm in awe of your work, Evgenia Albat, Dennis Staunton, Sylvie Kaufmann. And thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for thank cooperating you. with the, us, the European Press Prize, and uh, Anouan Edmer Epker, uh, uh, editor of the Bali, for putting this together. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>